always giving thanks. When we worship God, we should thank Him for His faithful promises. Here's Gene. This is a Psalm of David. In fact, in these praise psalms at the end, uh, about eight of them were written by David. Now, David wrote about half of all the psalms. There's 150 of them. But here you have eight of them that are uh, right together, listed together, and they come from the heart of David. And the focus is on David's thanksgiving. I love the way he introduces this psalm. I've called it a thankful heart. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. And there he's probably referring to the angels of the Lord. And perhaps even the evil spirits. He's going to praise God before all heavenly beings. I will bow down towards your holy temple. And there again, you see in the Psalms, the focus is on worshiping in Jerusalem where the temple was built. I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. And as we've seen uh, in other psalms, uh, a theme, particularly in terms of praise, is God's faithful love. God's eternal love. God's eternal love. God's eternal love is, uh, is a significant variable in terms of, of worship. And we have a thankful heart because of His eternal love. We love Him because He first loved us. David goes on to say, you have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased strength within me. Now, we don't know exactly what David is referring to there, but you can go back over his life, and he had a lot of time and events in which he could thank God for the strength that God gave him, all the way back to when he was a little shepherd boy. And he saw that giant, Goliath taunting God and taunting the children of Israel. And he went out into that valley with a five stones and a little slingshot. No armor. And uh, he said to the giant, you come to me with all your, your armor and your shield and your spear, but I come to you in the strength of the Lord. Maybe he was thinking of that specific event when he penned these words. Or he could have been thinking about the number of times that God delivered him from Saul when Saul tried to take his life. For example, when Saul tried to throw a spear at him. Twice we know at least he did it. And uh, God gave him the strength and the ability and the agility to sidestep it. Otherwise, he would have been pinned to the wall. So David could reflect back on his life and thank God for the strength that God had given him. And so he's He's praising God with a thankful heart. Now, in this uh, particular psalm, David is definitely thinking historically because he probably is writing in Jerusalem. He had actually settled into Jerusalem. Uh, Israel was at peace. And he was reflecting on uh, what God had done for him. And Naaman the prophet actually spoke to David the words of the Lord. And these were the words from the Lord that Nathan gave to David, which also caused him to lift up his voice in thankfulness to God. And these are the words that actually set the stage for this. If you go back to 2 Samuel 7:16 where you have a reference to God's words through Nathan about an eternal throne to David. And here's the words, your house, now what is the house? That's a temple. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. Now that's significant. Those are words that were spoken at a moment in history to David. And of course, God did establish His throne. Though David didn't live at that moment forever, it's prophesying on to what is going to come through Solomon, who died, disobeyed. But obviously, it's prophetic because it's referring 
to someone else whose throne will be established forever, and that throne obviously is the throne of Jesus Christ. And so you have a reference here to universal worship. If you get the background, you see the prophetic aspects of this. When uh, he went on to write in verses 4 and 5, All the kings on earth will give you thanks, Lord, when they hear what you have promised. Now, did that promise ever come true? Has it been fulfilled? Is there ever a time when all the kings on earth have bowed before God and His Son, Jesus Christ, to give thanks and praise. No. It's prophetic. But it goes on to say, when that happens, they will sing of the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. Now, the interesting thing is, when you go to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote these words when he wrote to the Philippians. Now, listen to what he said. He, prefaces, he prefaces these words by talking about the fact that we ought to have the same mind that Christ had when He was with the Father, and He didn't cling to that position. He laid it aside. He became a servant. He became a man and went even to the cross. He humbled Himself. But notice when you come to the end of that passage, notice what Paul said, and it directly ties in here with this psalm, I believe this prophetic statement about the kings of the earth. For this reason, Paul says, God highly exalted Him. That is because of His humility and because of who He is, the Son of God. For this reason, God highly exalted Him and gave Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee. All of the kings of the earth. And all humanity, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's everybody. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here in this psalm, this psalm of thanks and worship that David is penning, he is speaking prophetically. He doesn't understand completely all that he is writing. God didn't reveal that to him. But through the Holy Spirit of God, He is speaking prophetically. And He's talking about promises. And promises are so important in relationship to the Word of God. The promises that God has given us. Beginning with the promise that was stated to Abraham and repeated on to David and to others. And then the promises that it, God has given us in the New Testament. So here's the principle to live by. When we worship God, we should thank Him for His faithful promises. We should thank Him for His faithful promises. Here's a question I'd like for you to think about. In what creative ways can we use Paul's reassuring words in Romans 8, 31 to 39 to worship and thank God for His promises? Now, the reason I use this uh, basically it relates to a principle. Let me give you that principle to live by that grows out of that passage. Uh, in the New Testament setting, uh, that principle reads about our security in Christ. No matter the circumstances of life, we're to take comfort in the fact that we are secure in Christ now and eternally. And we should thank God for that. That should be a part of our worship. And so, uh, here we have an application, just one application of reflecting on the promises of God and thanking God for the promises that we have. And I want to I want to share with you these words. I want you to think about it. Listen to these words, which begin here in verse 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we're more than victorious through Him who loved us. We are victorious. For I am persuaded, Paul wrote, that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, 
hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an incredible promise.